Good morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. To those, to those of you who joined us yesterday, uh, welcome back and thank you for staying with us virtually. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you joining us uh, today. We do have a great lineup of speakers uh, throughout the day today and, and discussions uh, ranging from island security to blue economy, development financing, and US views on islands in the Indo-Pacific, which brings together um, a panel from both the current and previous administrations to discuss how the US views uh, the priorities in the region. We also have a keynote speech from Fiji this afternoon and hope you will remain with us for, uh, uh, with us through the day and engage with us both in person and virtually. Um, to begin the day two of the forum today, we are extremely thrilled to have this keynote speech from Sri Lankan Foreign Secretary and the conversation to be moderated by Lisa Curtis. I will briefly introduce Lisa, who will come on stage and welcome the Secretary. Um, Lisa Curtis is Senior Fellow and Director of the Indo-Pacific Security Program at uh, the Center for a New American Security. She is a foreign policy and national security expert with over 20 years of uh, service in the US government. She was previously deputy assistant to the president and senior director for South and Central Asia. Um, I welcome Ms. Curtis to the stage to introduce the secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Darshana, for that kind introduction. And thanks to the Carnegie Endowment and the Sasakawa Foundation for holding this important and timely event. It is my pleasure today to introduce Admiral and Professor Jayanath Kalambaj, who is currently the Foreign Secretary of Sri Lanka. Admiral Kalambaj served in the Sri Lankan Navy for 36 years, and he retired as the Commander of the Navy in July 2014. Following his retirement, he was director for indo lankan Relations at the Pathfinder Foundation. He is a graduate of the Defense Services Staff College in India and the Royal College of Defense Studies in the UK. He holds a PhD from General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University in Sri Lanka. He also holds master's degrees from Madras University in India and King's College in London. Ambassador Columbus has been a visiting lecturer at the University of Colombo Defense Services Command and Staff College, at Kodawala Defense University, at the Bandarnayaka Center for International Studies, and the Bandarnayaka International Diplomatic Training Institute. He is a fellow at the Nautical Institute in London, as well as a guest professor at Sichuan University and Leshen Normal University in China and as an adjunct professor at the National Institute of South China Sea Studies in Haiku, China. Admiral Kalambaj was previously the additional secretary to the President for Foreign Relations. So without further ado, let me hand the floor to Admiral Kalambaj. I come from a small island nation in the Indian Ocean, 65,000 square kilometers of size, 1,400 kilometers of coastline. It is at the tip of the southernmost landmass of India. It is equal distance from Dubai in Persian Gulf and Singapore in Malacca Strait. It is very close to the most critical, most important sea lines of communications across the Indian Ocean, which is only 12 nautical miles south of this country. The country that I came from is Sri Lanka. Admiral Harry Harris, who was the Pacific commander, addressing the Gaul Dialogue in 2016, mentioned three distinct strategic advantages for this small country called Sri Lanka. He said, number one, the location. Number two, the location. Number three, 
the location. Why did I mention these little facts about Sri Lanka? Because it is a perfect example of the strategic competition that we witness on a day-to-day -day basis in the Indian Ocean among the major powers, residential or outside the region. For some, Sri Lanka is a soccer pitch or a football pitch to play the game on. For some, Sri Lanka is a chess board to continue the game. And for some, it is a punching bag. Now, we don't want to be the soccer pitch, the chess board, or the punching bag. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am privileged and I'm very happy to be here. I have not really worked with Carnegie USA, but I have done a lot of work with Carnegie India, with Dr. Rajasi Mohan and Darshana. In fact, on the way here, I heard my friend talking to Darshana, and I asked, who is this Darshana? And she said, probably Sri Lankan. Little I knew that I was about to cross my path again with Darshana because I have worked quite a lot with her. And of course, Sasakawa, I have heard quite a lot, never really worked directly. And Lisa Curtis, I'm honored to be moderated by you this session. The last time I met you was in Jaipur, Rajasthan in 2015. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, let me deliver my talk. And if you challenge me to describe the situation in the Indian Ocean just by using six words, I would say this is a region of strategic competition, two words, strategic convergence, two more words, and strategic dilemma. Perfectly done. Strategic competition, strategic convergence, and strategic dilemma, six words. And if I beg you to give me two more words, now I would add strategic chaos as well. So this is the Indian Ocean today. If I further explain the strategic competition, I have another three words to describe it. It's RMB, but it's not RMB Yuan. It is resources, markets, and bases. Believe it or not, the competition in the Indian Ocean is based on RMB. Now, the situation in the Indian Ocean has given rise to a security dilemma. Insecurity of some has given rise to insecurity of many others, which has resulted in a security dilemma. Now, I mentioned the third set of word, strategic dilemma, and that is for smaller, less militarily and economically powerful, large number of littorals like Sri Lanka in the Indian Ocean, this situation has given a strategic dilemma. We see the resurgence of traditional security concerns, and we don't want to be part of this competition. And what we need is to mind our own business and prosper as a country. What we need is strategic autonomy, but not to be part of this competition. And honestly, we don't like to see a single power becoming a hegemonic power in the Indian Ocean. The final set of words I requested you to give me, that is strategic chaos, is evolving now. It has led to a very chaotic situation even among the alliances that are there in the Indian Ocean. On this backdrop, Sri Lanka, being a small country, geostrategically located, had to come out with certain foreign policy directives to overcome this situation. Number one, we wish to remain neutral in this game. Technically, we are a non-aligned country, that's true. But whilst being a non-aligned country, 
we wish to remain neutral because we simply don't want to be part of this power game. And we want to maintain friendly relations with everyone. All the countries, we consider them as friendly. No one is enemy. And also economic prosperity and engagement is our priority. These are the three key foreign policy that we have. And very importantly, the fourth one is that we don't want any country, any power to use our soil or our water to be a threat to another country, and especially so to India. So we don't want to be a strategic security concern to India. So this is Sri Lanka's foreign policy amongst, amidst this major power game that we witness, as I mentioned, on a daily basis in the country and in the Indian Ocean. We all know what Indian Ocean is, but let me share some thoughts, some figures, some ideas. We know that it is the third largest ocean in the world, and it is also the most populous and economically the most dynamic region in the world today, in the 21st century. We know this equation that is 50% of containers, 72% of energy, and 35% of bulk cargo for the world is carried across the Indian Ocean. And therefore, we can assume that every country in the Indian Ocean is super rich. Why? So much of trade is flowing across the Indian Ocean. However, unfortunately, much of this trade that I mentioned is not within the Indian Ocean region literals. It is for outside. It is not for us. It is for outside. Now, Indian Ocean is the artery of world energy. We keep talking about renewable energy, cutting down carbon emission. We, it's all there. But even today, we depend on the fossil fuel, even today. And therefore, the Indian Ocean, coming from the Persian Gulf mainly, is the artery of world energy, whether it is fuel or gas. Now, there are many net energy importers like India, China, Japan, Korea, and they do depend on the Indian Ocean to obtain these vital resources or vital sources of energy. Then the Indian Ocean is also a nuclear, nuclearized ocean. We have two countries in the Indian Ocean, that is India and Pakistan who are nuclear powers. And if you go to the wider Pacific region, then we have other countries like uh, North Korea with a nuclear program. But if you take the Indian Ocean per se, there are other powers, some residential, some not, like USA, France, UK, Russia, in the Indian Ocean. And now enter the crocodile Dundee with a little more nuclear ambition, that is, Australia into the game. Now, in the wider Indian Ocean, let me share some thoughts about the region that Sri Lanka is, that is the South Asia. Now, South Asia is home to one of the oldest civilization, good culture, tradition, practically major religions in the world. However, in the 21st century, it is the least economically integrated region in the world. Only less than 5% of our combined GDP is economically integrated. Now, if I quickly share this with ASEAN, it is hovering around 25% inter-ASEAN trade. That is why when the COVID pandemic hit us, we were pretty badly hit because we were thinking beyond our region for businesses, not within our region. There are reasons for that. One of the reasons is lack of quality maritime related infrastructure. We don't have. Of course, Sri Lanka is blessed in that sense. We have quite a, a high level of maritime infrastructure. There was a report released by the World Bank a few years ago. They said 50% of world infrastructure requirements are in Asia. 
and they estimated about 16 trillion US dollars needed to develop infrastructure in Asia. And we can all assume that majority of that comes to the South Asian region. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we say that about the Indian Ocean, we say it is a very rich ocean, it's a warm water ocean, abundant of fish, but right now it has more plastic than fish, that's a different story. But Indian Ocean is super rich with strategies. Super, super rich because so many different strategies are there for the Indian Ocean, right? Topping the list is the America's Indo-Pacific strategy. Then we have Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Now we have Australia's Indo-Pacific concept. Now ASEAN, outlook on the Indo-Pacific. India's Indian Ocean region strategy and Sagar, security and growth for all in the region. Recently, the German came out with their own Indo-Pacific strategy and then South Korea's new Southern policy. All these strategies are focusing, of course, on the Pacific, but right now it is more to do with the Indian Ocean. Now, among these strategies, there is also China's Belt and Road Initiative, and Japan and India got together for Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. Unfortunately, not much progress has been made on that. And, of course, we now know there is another strategy concerning the Indian Ocean that is A, UK, US. We don't know where this is heading right now because we see a lot of controversial things happening. So there are so many strategies regarding the Indian Ocean from Indian Ocean residential powers as well as outside powers in the Indian Ocean. Now these strategies brings out concepts one of the concept is free and open in the Pacific. We all can agree it has to be a free and open. Then freedom of navigation and overfly. Again, we have to agree that it is something needed. But there is a problem coming when we introduce another concept saying it is for the like-minded liberal democracies. So who is that? Are we trying to eliminate some is a question that we have. Sea of freedom and prosperity. Which will, be, which will be open and transparent to all. A place of value, of freedom, rule of law, market economy, free from force or coercion, and a prosperous region. And another concept is a credible deterrent. So these are the concepts which are coming out of the strategies that I mentioned. So now, in this situation, the Indian Ocean literals, what do they want, right? I think what we really want is to maintain sovereignty, independence of our individual countries. Now, if you take the Indian Ocean, there's a huge asymmetry of capacities and capabilities among the countries. So how do we overcome the asymmetry in this international domain or regional domain is by having rules. Because if there are rules, everyone abide by it, no one try to dictate terms on the other. And also we want freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight. Then also we want amicable, peaceful resolution of maritime territorial disputes, free and fair reciprocal trade, Enhanced maritime connectivity. I told you how little we are connected as a region. Of course, investment and regional integration through connectivity. These are some of the things that most of the Indian Ocean literals want to take place in the Indian Ocean. And we simply do not want to see one hegemonic power ruling the Indian Ocean. We don't want that to happen. We want Indian Ocean to be open. Well, it is not even practical to have one country ruling the Indian Ocean. One can argue there was a time, long time ago, during uh, leading up to Second World War, Britain was ruling much of the Indian Ocean, but now it's not practically possible. Now, we don't like to be forced to choose. 
We don't like to hedge one country against the other. We don't want to choose and bandwagon with one group of country against the other. What we need most is strategic autonomy to make decisions for our sake, for make decisions for our people's sake, and that is to enhance on maritime trade and prosperity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this situation that I have described up to now is somewhat like a volcano waiting to erupt. You see, it's, it's a very difficult, dangerous situation in the Indian Ocean. And therefore, we want to prevent escalation of risk and further militarization of the Indian Ocean. Unfortunately, the seas of Asia is today witnessing a historical anomaly. There are concurrent rise of two powers in and around Indian Ocean, whilst the America, whilst USA maintain the dominion power. These two powers which are concurrently rising are India and China. Now, China's and India's maritime interest, unfortunately, fueled by very impressive economic growth, is meeting in the Indian Ocean. Of course, they have a land border which is contested. There are some issues there. But now, both these countries, they had an inward-oriented economy until fairly recently. But now, they are looking at outward-leaning economy. When a rising power is looking outward-leaning, obviously, their interests come into the ocean. Now, therefore, this situation of two powers rising concurrently in the Indian Ocean has given rise to insecurity of many and an arms race. Now, if we believe that the Indian Ocean is the center of gravity of world maritime trade, and therefore, right now, the Indian Ocean is center of gravity of major power strategies as well. Now, although I mentioned a lot about Indian Ocean, we can never talk about Indian Ocean alone without referring to the Pacific Ocean, at least the Western Pacific Ocean, because this is, you know, the humans draw lines and divide, but the nature and the, the ocean does not divide like that. So we need to look at in both sails. Now, when you talk about maritime security and Sri Lanka and in the Indian Ocean, this is a very important aspect. Now, we all know that after September 11 attacks, the maritime security assumed a greater significance in the world. And we all know on that fateful day, not even an ounce of explosives were used to bring down the World Trade Center. It was ordinary commercial passenger aircraft. Then the whole world were thinking, oh my God, what if a group of terrorists get hold of a ship and load it with a weapon of mass destruction, come and explode? What will be the effect? Now, therefore, maritime security has assumed greater significance in the Indian Ocean. It is compounded by the major power game, but not only them. There are a large number of non-state actors prevalent and exercising their power in the Indian Ocean. And for the Indian Ocean international trade to continue, we need cooperation. We need to abide by the rules. We need to abide by the laws governing the ocean. Well, I can say that up to a very high degree, that situation is there in the Indian Ocean. People are generally abiding by the rules. Increasingly, nations are very conscious about their maritime domain, the maritime strategy. What Rudyard Kipling said about England, if big steamers don't come, they will starve. It is true even in the 21st century for many other countries. Now, the question is, Will the Indian Ocean littorals guard this freedom 
with their blood and treasure or they will be happy to pass it on to some other powers and enjoy the benefits. So this is a question that is begging because many literals do not have the capacities and the capabilities to guard this ocean. Now I mentioned about the fourth set of words, strategic chaos. Now unfortunately, Indian Ocean is a very dynamic region. Every year something new is happening and right now the situation in Afghanistan and how will that impact on the Indian Ocean is of great concern. Sri Lanka, together with many countries, are deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation there, illegal narcotic trade taking place from Afghanistan, proliferation of small arms. You know, Sri Lanka was one of the countries badly affected by what was left in Afghanistan during the previous wars. And incidentally, we have a fighter pilot among us. One of the first attack on Sri Lanka Air Force aircraft, a surface to air fired missile came from Afghanistan region. It, didn't, it was not manufactured there, but it came from there. So we are very concerned, proliferation of small arms. Then how will that impact the radicalization and extremist ideology coming out? And as I mentioned, a region of weak integration, weak economies, how will this country impact on the regional integration and the prosperity in the region? Another problem. No discussion on the Indian Ocean is complete if I don't mention something about COD. Now, we all know COD was created somewhere around 2004. Initially, it was as a response to the Boxing Day tsunami to help countries to overcome the perils of tsunami. And of course, now they have become of age. And there are many questions about COD than answers right now. Number one question is, what is the objective of COD? Is it purely to counter rising China? Is it collectively to control China in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific? Can COD members leverage, leverage concessions from China as a collective entity? Is it going to be I-COD or E-COD, exclusive COD or inclusive COD? Will there be a conflict between COD and AUKUS? Because we do see some issues coming out. Will COD officialize the unofficial maritime cool war which is taking place in the region? And will it be leading to another big arms race in the region? And will it be somewhat similar to a mini NATO? There are many questions about COD than answers. Now in that sense, I would argue that the Indian Ocean is the most militarized ocean in the world right now. At any given time, around 120 warships are patrolling the waters of the Indian Ocean. And we don't know how many submarines are there, we don't know how many aircraft are there, military, and we don't know how many unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned underwater vehicles are there. So that is why I said Indian Ocean is a volcano. We wish that it will not erupt but that's the situation. I have a very interesting set of figures to share with you. If you look at Sri Lanka and the number of warships coming to Sri Lanka from 2009 to 2021, 563 warships have visited us. We are so happy about it. Why? Because we make some money by giving facilities and then we are considered as a free and friendly country. But this is an indication how many or how much of warships are there in the Indian Ocean. And if you ask me a little more detail, who is stopping the list? Obviously India, they are our neighbor, so close, with 121 ships. Despite the belief that China is present in, the Sri, Lan in Sri Lankan territory, it is Japanese warships with 97 second in the list. China is way down with 46 warships, and of course the list goes down. Now, when you talk about the Indian Ocean, when you talk about Sri Lanka, 
it's not only this power game which is a matter of concern. There are a large number of non-state actors, very active, very much prevalent in the Indian Ocean. Now, we don't talk much about another unforeseen enemy, that is the ocean pollution. Unfortunately, this warm water ocean supposed to be abundant with fish and other resources is fast becoming a depleted resource ocean. We know that there is a 60,000 square kilometer dead zone in the Bay of Bengal, which was discovered only in 2016. No nitrogen, no oxygen, no life. Now, if it grows, the entire Bay of Bengal is gone. And we also know there is a huge garbage patch in the southern part of the Indian Ocean. And it is supposed to be growing as well. And one fine, one fine day, there will be more plastic in the Indian Ocean than fish. Right? So this is a very dangerous situation in the maritime environment in the Indian Ocean. We keep talking about other forms of maritime security, but if the Indian Ocean is so polluted, and we also know that the global warming is real, Arctic ice is melting, the scientists have discovered the world, temperatures have risen more than 13% that they expected about a decade ago. That's not very good news for the Indian Ocean. Plastic dumping is huge. Toxic waste dumping is huge. And we keep adding pollutants to the ocean. Because there was this belief, ocean is vast, big, you can dump anything. But it's not really. It has its own limitations as well. Then another enemy is the illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. The FAO gave a statistic few years ago, they said 40% of fishing taking place in the Indian Ocean is IUU fishing. That means illegal, unreported, and unregulated. That means the end of the fish stocks in decades to come. Then, of course, maritime terrorism is a huge problem in the Indian Ocean. Sri Lanka was a very bad victim of maritime uh, terrorism. And of course, we overcame it. But now there are many other situations concerning maritime. It is a flash, flashpoint. It can be exploited by various interested parties. Then there is irregular migration by sea. Sri Lanka was considered as a source country until about 2012. Now we have managed to overcome. Lisa, if you tell me the time, how much? OK. So now we have overcome that situation as well. Now illegal narcotic trade is huge taking place. Sri Lanka is unfortunately uh, a transshipment hub for narcotic and also a user. And piracy is there. Of course, right now it is the incidence of piracy is zero. But the ships which came to protect their shipping is still there. So we have a huge problem. Now, ladies and gentlemen, now what do we really want in this Indian Ocean among this, all the strategies? We want it to be considered as a global common and open to all, not a closed ocean, but an open ocean. In 1971, Sri Lanka proposed that Indian Ocean should be a zone of peace, denuclearization, demilitarization, not having additional military bases. But all that has taken place during the last 50 years, and even now we wish that to happen, which will never happen. right? So therefore, what we really need now is an Indian Ocean regional strategy for, to address the issues that we have experiencing, we have been experiencing in the Indian Ocean. We need to be aware of the threats. We need to have collaborative engagement with our literal countries. Of course, we have to work with every power. But that is something pretty much lacking in the Indian Ocean. I mentioned to you so many strategies about the Indian Ocean from outside Indian Ocean, and not a single proper one for the Indian Ocean from the Indian Ocean literals. 
We have Indian Ocean Rim Association, we have Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, we have Gold Dialogue, we have Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue. There are many initiatives we have. We have to make it happen and come out with a regional maritime security architecture and a regional mechanism to ensure that this critically important ocean will remain so for the sake of the Indian Ocean littorals and also for the sake of the entire world. With this, I conclude my talks. Thank you very much for listening. Admiral Kalambek, that was just remarkable. Uh, that was a really tour de horizon of uh, Sri Lanka and its interest. And I'm so glad you mentioned Admiral Harry Harris's comment about Sri Lanka and the importance of location, location, location. Um, I've long been writing and talking about that very point, uh, the strategic location of Sri Lanka, uh, why the country matters. And I'll just mention that when I was NSC Senior Director for South and Central Asia, we had a South Asia strategy, we had a Central Asia strategy, but we also had a Sri Lanka strategy. It was the only country in my portfolio that had its own strategy, showing the importance of the US-Sri Lankan relationship. I wanted to dive in a little bit more into the issue of you know, Sri Lanka finding itself at the center of this very important geopolitical competition vis-a-vis -vis China. At the same time, we have China-India relations really deteriorating since the Gawan border crisis mm -hmm. last year. Uh, so I would like to know, how does, Sri Lanka, uh, how does Sri Lanka deal with that factor, that deteriorating relationship between China and India? And I'll just note that you, in fact, uh, uh, retired from the Navy, from your naval commander position, just months before China docked a submarine at Colombo port in the fall of 2014. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, you know, that's a, a while ago, but was Sri Lanka surprised at India's reaction? And was there anything that was kind of learned from that uh, experience? I wonder if you could answer that. Well, Lisa, you are right. I mean, um, you see India is a major power in the region, biggest population, nearly 7,500 coastline. One thing Sri Lanka has come to terms with, or one thing Sri Lanka has to understand is, Sri Lanka is pretty much part of the Indian maritime security umbrella, period. Because unfortunately for India, a ship, a warship, cannot go around India from east to west. It has to go around Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka is so close to Indian southern coast, right? So therefore, we are part of Indian maritime security as well as air security umbrella because we are so close. And that is why Mr. Shiva Shankar Menon mentioned Sri Lanka is an aircraft carrier parked 14 nautical miles away. We don't want to be an aircraft carrier, right? And you are right, when the Chinese submarines docked in 2014, yes, I was the commander at that time, we never took it any seriously because we, as I mentioned, 563 warships have visited Sri Lanka from 2009 to 2021. That's a large, large number. There was a time per year we were getting more than 60 warships, so we were open to anyone. We did not see, uh, of course, it was not even a nuclear submarine. It was a conventional submarine. It was not two submarines coming twice. It was same submarine coming twice. There were some issues. So naturally, India is concerned. And that is why in our foreign policy, by name, we only refer to India. That means we don't want to be, we can't afford to be a strategic security concern to India. That is why in my lecture I said we categorically do not want a country to use our country or our waters to be a threat to another country. Because if we upset that regional strategic balance in our neighborhood, we have problems. Right? So we are very mindful about India's strategic security concern. We are trying our best to divide 
as far as security and strategic concerns are concerned, India is our primary task, uh, the priority. But then we need to engage with the rest of the world. We need economic prosperity. Right now, we are having a very difficult, we are going through a very difficult time because of COVID, right? So we can't just say, okay, we are only with India and everything is good economically. No, it will never happen. India is another big country, but still, they cannot look after everything else. So therefore, our relations with China is again a very long traditional relationship, very strong one, but it's more economic oriented. Not military. I gave you some figures of warships visiting Sri Lanka. They are quite low, right? And despite this argument that the Sri Lankan ports can be used uh, to be a threat to other countries, it cannot happen, right? So we are, I think we have done a good job in dividing our uh, focus, uh, more economic focus with China and understanding India's strategic security concerns. Great. Thank you. That, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I'd like to shift to India, or I'm sorry, U.S.-Sri Lanka relations. And I would like to ask, what kind of a role would you like to see the U.S. play in the region? And in particular, where do you think the U.S.-Sri Lanka bilateral relationship should go? Where, where can it grow? And maybe what are some of the challenges? You see, USA is our major number one export trading partner. That is, uh, most of our commodities, most of our products are going to USA. So that is, a, they are playing a very significant role in our economy. And we need to work with America like any other power. Of course, they are the major power. So they can help by bringing in foreign direct investment to country or channeling foreign direct investment to Sri Lanka. We are not asking for loans. We are not asking for grants. But what we really, really need is foreign direct investment coming to the country. Give us choices, right? If you leave only a vacuum and say, oh, you have violated human rights, we are not coming to invest, that's not what we want, right? So I, I mean, I would urge not to weaponize the human rights, not to uh, politicize human rights, but please channel direct investment. And I think I can, I'm very happy to say, I think last week we signed a big deal with a US company, Fortress Energy, and that's a great thing. Uh, we really need more and more investment like that. So we need to work very closely with the United States. And United States also should respect the Sri Lankan sovereignty, Sri Lankan independence, and Sri Lankan integrity, and be a partner in progress, development of the country. Mm -hmm. Through, uh, of course, there are a lot of involvement with the US military. Whether Army, Navy or Air Force, a lot of bilateral training is going on and US has been great, uh, graceful enough to uh, give us two warships already and the third one is on the way. So I think it is at a very high level. But we can do more. We can do more and we can benefit in uh, America's overall strategy by using the geographical location. Mm -hmm. But then it doesn't mean that we should give away all our other friends. That's, that's the dilemma that we are having. Well, I, I absolutely agree. And I think the U.S. is interested in seeing Sri Lanka maintain its independence, its sovereignty, just as you pointed out. So I think the U.S. and Sri Lanka have that goal yes. uh, in mind. But you did raise that Sri Lanka doesn't want grants. So I, I do want to ask about the Millennium Challenge Corporation uh, 480 million grant that the U.S. worked on with Sri Lanka in partnership with Sri Lanka for I think about four years, going back, mm -hmm. you know, to the Obama administration, then the uh, Trump administration. But uh, of course, you know, Sri Lanka uh, turned that down. Um, and I just have to ask the question: Who do you think benefited? from Sri Lanka losing that opportunity to access uh, grant funding, 48, 480 million, that would have gone to the Sri Lankan people for their development, economic development needs? Well, Lisa, you're asking me a very difficult question. Uh, the one simple <laughs> answer I have as to why it didn't happen, the answer is democracy. Sri Lanka is one of the oldest democracies in the region, and the people's opinion matter. The government, the presidents, we have executive presidency. Of course, we have a parliament with two-third majority. But even then, 
unless the people are with you, nothing can happen. So the MCC was a perfect example of people of Sri Lanka feeling that we don't want it. Of course, we would have loved to have 480 million US dollars as a grant. Perfect. But then when you dig into the nitty gritties, people were feeling a little bit suspicious about the deal or the condition. And they were feeling, you know, okay, this is a, uh, the grant is a great thing, but we have to in return give this concession, that concession, this immunity. So there was a huge debate in Sri Lanka. So that is why I use the word democracy. Now that finally people's power prevailed. And unfortunately, you know, it was actually create, uh, discussed, created by the previous government. They couldn't do it, right? It was passed on to this government. Even if they wanted, the public opinion was not for it, unfortunately. And then it did not happen. And I don't think it is the reason. The reason is an external power pressurizing the people to change. No, it was actually a homegrown fear. You know, Sri Lanka is a small country, not a rich country, but we pride our sovereignty, we pride our integrity greatly. So then people felt, my God, this is a good thing, but our sovereignty can be compromised. So unfortunately, it didn't happen. So I think when we are dealing with uh, even a grant, I think that is some, there are some lessons we can learn from. Mm. And I can't answer the question who would have benefited because, you know, it didn't happen that well, thank you. I, it's unfortunate. A lot of work went into that from both mm -hmm. sides. And hopefully moving forward, the U.S. and Sri Lanka can find ways for beneficial you know, grant making mm -hmm. and uh, economic development by working together. So, yeah, that's my hope moving yeah. forward. Um, also, you did not mention a, a very seminal event in Sri Lanka, and that was the horrific Easter terrorist attacks uh, that happened in April 2019. Mm -hmm. um, it was very sad, uh, tragic time. I was at the NSC at the time, mm -hmm. and um, I attended a very moving memorial ceremony for mm -hmm. the victims held at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and I I'll never forget that. Uh, and you talked a little bit about Afghanistan and some of Sri Lanka's mm -hmm. concerns that the Taliban's rise to power could impact terrorism trends as far as you know, Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that and what are some of the things that Sri Lanka is doing now to try to prevent the, the impact from mm -hmm. Afghanistan and perhaps the, the increased terrorist threat that will be coming out of that country. Uh, knowing that we had these horrible, horrible mm -hmm. uh, attacks in 2019, just a little over two years ago, that of course were connected to ISIS-K, yeah. not the Taliban, but we know that these groups uh, interact, mm -hmm. they share logistics, training, yeah. etc. So what, what can you say about that? Well, I mean, Lisa, you're right. The Easter bombing 2019, that was the single most dastardly act of terrorism to taken place in Sri Lankan soil. Although we fought a terrible war uh, with the LTTE for three decades, a single event like that had never happened. But this one was really uh, one of the worst, heinous crimes ever committed in Sri Lanka. Very peacefully, on a religiously important day, the Easter Sunday, people went to church to pray to the God and little they knew that someone will walk in filled with explosive bag and explode themselves. Now, a few things. Whether it is a link to ISIS, well, obviously, it has got the ideology from the ISIS. But I would believe it did not really emanate from the ISIS. It was a homegrown uh, group. But of course, uh, this, although this happened in 2019, April, when you now track down, we can see for the, the, about three years before that, things were taking place. They were getting ready, but unfortunately, the government of Sri Lanka did not pay attention to national security. There were, they say there were like 92 warnings ignored, and unfortunately, we did not take uh, seriously these warnings, and that happened. Of course, it happened, and then government quickly moved in, arrested all those place, uh, the people involved, and now the charges are being framed, and they are, the, the, the judicial system is now taking place. 
and also government thinking about you know how do we reconcile because it's not a good because we are a small country and our uh, population is only 22 million out of that about 10 percent are muslim muslims have been traditionally very much part of sri lankan society they were never considered as aliens they were never considered as enemies right but unfortunately once this happened then there were uh, the, the social fabric of the country was torn apart so we need to patch it up now of course that is taking place uh, i mean since then zero incidents regarding that that we are very happy about it but we still see that certain elements of this society are trying to use the deep web and the dark web mm -hmm. and to create violence or incite violence it, it is happening and the inciting radicalization is happening now our worry is because you know 2019 incident happened influenced by the ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Now we have another situation much closer home, right? We have another situation much closer home. It is uh, 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 another Islamic state, but there's nothing wrong with us, Islamic state. But then where they came to power, it is a concern, right? So how will that impact the region is a major concern. And we have seen that large number of small arms, helicopters, tanks are there in Afghanistan. I don't think uh, they, they will even want to use them because there are so much. Now, what will they do with this? Because we have a terrible experience in the 80s when the LTT war started. One place where they went for supplies were Afghanistan, Pakistan board actually at that time. So will, that, will the history, is the history repeating itself? is a big worry we have. And then, Lisa, last month alone, Sri Lanka Navy intercepted more than one ton of heroin. One mm. ton. So that's, that's a huge quantity, right? So will the Taliban regime control the narcotic trade or whether they will ignore it and let it happen? This is another concern we have because that is actually a deterrent to our society, the drugs illegal narcotic drugs. We don't want to be a user country. We don't want to be a transshipment uh, country. So these are the two things which are really, really worried, worrying Sri Lanka. And now again, you see, SARC, the South Asia, very conveniently, we don't address bilateral issues. We don't take on board the issues between our countries. So we are not really addressing the issue. We are not even talking about what is happening in, 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 in uh, Afghanistan as a region. Right? So we are all doing the waiting game to see how the world will react, how the world will recognize or whether it will be recognized. We are just playing the, uh, playing the waiting game. So this is a problem in our region. We, we are not united in addressing the issues which are cru crucial to us. Well, I think you've just explained why Sri Lanka is so important, uh, not only for the maritime issues, but also counterterrorism. And so there are uh, opportunities for the U.S. and Sri Lanka to expand their cooperation. Uh, you mentioned the naval cooperation, but also on counterterrorism. And of course, the U.S. did cooperate with Sri Lanka oh, yes. after the Easter attacks. And um, I think our relationship really strengthened uh, because of that. Uh, but I think you, you've just spelled out uh, how important Sri Lanka is, uh, not only in terms of maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. but also a, a terrorism-free region yes, as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm afraid we're out of time, Admiral, but thank you so much. It was a very informative discussion, and it's great to see you again, and you. good luck to you. Thank you, Lisa. Nice to be here. Thank you, Darshana. Good luck. Thank you.